Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where, yes, I am still in lockdown here in the UK, and I know that many of you listening are too. So thank you so much for all your emails, and please keep them coming in. I don't want to just waffle into this microphone each day, knowing that you're all listening out there, but just a little bit too shy to say hello, because nobody emails into a radio station or a podcast host, do they? But I want you to do that. I'm inviting you to do that. So please send me a quick message to techblogwriter at outlook.com and tell me where you're listening to this podcast because I'm sure you have an incredibly busy life listening to podcasts and you never even have the time to sit down and send that email or direct message on a social platform. But now you have that time. So why not introduce yourself to me? Now, at the moment, I'm allowed to leave the house once a day for exercise, so I've decided to begin my day at 6am with a three-mile run and try to keep myself sane. And it does keep away the cobwebs and and helps me think far away from the distractions of laptop, TV and smartphone screens. And today, I thought to myself, we don't daydream or just sit there quietly and allow our minds to wander. Now, I know... It has never been easier to learn a new skill or language or learn how to play a musical instrument, read loads of books and so much more. So if you are sat at home, wherever it is that you are in the world and you're feeling a little bit bored, why not switch off the TV and your smartphone and dedicate 30 minutes of your lockdown time doing something just for you? I'm sure you can spare 30 minutes just for you because because I think if you dedicate that 30 minutes a day, Something will change you as a human and see you emerge as a completely different person when this pandemic clears and have you ready for the opportunities ahead. I mean, for example, imagine if you have three months where every day for 30 minutes you have consumed knowledge from multiple books, learned a skill from YouTube videos and online tutorials. Anything's possible, isn't it? Well, there's my motivational thought for the day. But please share yours with me by emailing me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. But this is not a self-improvement podcast. It's a tech podcast, isn't it? So on with today's show, where today, where today we're going to be talking to Shi Kai from a company called Longhash Ventures, which are a global blockchain incubator and investor. And in a nutshell, they seek financial returns through venture building and investing in early stage blockchain startups with a mission to enable the Web 3.0 blockchain native economy. And they source projects globally, leveraging especially on their strong Asia network across key hubs such as Singapore, China, Hong Kong and Japan. And in addition to providing capital, they're also supporting portfolio companies with rigorous hands-on venture building platforms with a strategy formulation and go-to-market execution all of which on their comprehensive investor network. And all that intrigued me. And I wanted to try and unpack much of what they're doing there and and the future for Web 3.0 too. So let's get Shikai onto the podcast now, who's waiting to speak with us in Singapore. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Hi, everyone. And thank you, Neil, for inviting me to the show. Uh, my name is Shikai, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Longhash Ventures, where I lead the incubation and investment efforts uh, for the early stage blockchain companies, which we look at. So I've been doing this for about a year and a half now, and we've incubated 18 companies so far. Uh, we've helped all of these early stage companies raise more than 11 million, uh, and we're looking to do more of that uh, with the spirit of a web three ecosystem in mind. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Just a bit about myself before Longhash Ventures or a blockchain industry in general. Uh, I was previously at McKinsey doing consulting for some of the largest companies with a focus on digital transformation and analytics in the financial and telecommunication sector uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, When I learned about blockchain and its potential 
to create a new generation of the internet or rather the next step in the evolution of the web, I was so excited that I decided that this must be the thing to do in our lifetime. Fantastic. And I think it's also worth highlighting that I'm obviously here in the UK lockdown and you're in uh, Singapore at the moment. And we are both, in fact, everyone listening are all surrounded by a great deal of uncertainty at the moment. So I've got to ask, I mean, how are you Hmm. dealing with the current climate as a business leader? The startup sector and also the investment sector, I'd say that uncertainty is kind of uh, the normal for us. (laughs) Uh, And especially in the blockchain sector where, you know, regulations can change all of a sudden. Uh, token investments, as you can see, changes all the time. There's so much volatility in the markets and new innovation is happening every day. And we have to always keep up to date with the progress. So I'd say that uh, we've always been positioning ourselves in preparation for uncertainty. And thanks to that, I think we are fortunate enough that uh, we do have a solid financial position to last through this difficult period. Uh, And we will continue to focus on our core activities, which is the incubation, uh, which will generate sufficient revenue for us. We will be a bit more careful with investments, uh, but I think there will still be very many attractive opportunities. We're also kind of supplementing uh, our revenue streams with some side projects uh, and also using this downtime to strategize and potentially build out new product lines to strengthen our proposition. Now, you did mention Web 3.0 a minute ago, so I feel we've got to talk about that. But I am conscious we do have people listening from all over the world, both in the tech industry and outside of the tech industry. So just to get everybody on that same page, can you just explain exactly what uh, what Web 3 is? All right. So a lot of people think about uh, blockchain and they they immediately think about crypto or they just think, okay, it's some kind of... uh, uh, authentication or distributed ledgers, just like a database for enterprises to cut cost and so on. Uh, but to us, Web3 represents the immense potential and thesis for the eventual adoption for blockchain as a, as a fundamental infrastructure uh, to enable more open innovation. So it, to us, it's really Web3 is about in the evolution of the internet. And to explore the story, we we kind of need to start from the beginning, right? Uh, When the internet was founded, what we call Web 1.0, we started off with features or or more like websites, pages, where you can store, find, and read information. So we're talking about very simple web pages, and some of the uh, more mature people with us will remember Alta Vista or GeoCities. These are very simple applications. And, and it to, even to this day, maybe Wikipedia kind of resembles that kind of generation. Then we evolved into Web 2.0, where we now are able to interact with content uh, information in a much more dynamic way. And the data becomes kind of part of everyday life. It, it permeates the entire internet space, right? So here we talk about things like YouTube and Instagram or social media where you now have video content, you have social media, you have photos, you have all sorts of uh, identifiers and metadata floating around uh, in the internet very abundantly. But what has been missing from this entire ecosystem is a, a kind of digital native way for assets to be created and flow in the same way that information has been able to in the Web 2.0 generation. And The creation of that possibility is what we call Web 3.0, a generation of the internet where assets, which are digitally natively created, can freely flow. Some people also call it uh, the kind of internet of everything or the semantic web. So this is what Tim Berners-Lee was talking about. But a common thread among all of these definitions, it is that the internet will be composed of entities. So it's no longer just pages of static information. It's no longer just uh, kind of pieces of data or content. It becomes more like entities that become searchable, can interact, and can even have value. So what's what's different about uh, Web 3.0 and how, how can this happen? So this, uh, I actually wrote about this uh, 
in a bit more detail on, on a piece on NASDAQ, actually. So I had an op-ed there and also elaborated on this uh, in a Medium article if you'd like to read more. But I can give a quick summary here in that uh, in the digital space, the people who write the code are kind of like the gods of that universe, right? They, they kind of have omnipotence in, in whatever uh, assets can be created. Imagine like a game where they can create any uh, coins at any point of time. They can change your account, lock you out to make you a totally different thing. So they're kind of digital masters of the universe. That means that it, it's fundamentally a virtual uh, platform. It's not really real. It's kind of like a, a mirror, a shadow of the real world in a way. But with clever cryptography and code and the invention of blockchain, we can actually make these assets real. Because once you give the control back to the users with some clever encryption, I can create or manage certain assets that the platform or the software creators are not able to delete or change against my will. Only when the users sign a transaction uh, with this encryption that they can move these assets around, change these assets, use it to interact with each other. So in this way, these digital assets can be verifiable and they can represent real value. So that's in that context, that's where Bitcoin was created. So a lot of people think of Bitcoin as kind of the the only or the best use case for blockchain or Web 3.0, I would say it is simply the, the MVP of Web 3.0. It is the first digital native asset that has been created and does not need any company, any person to manage it. It can run on its own. And I think that that is the spirit of Web 3.0, where something is fundamentally digital. You don't need any physical representation. You just need code and a community that can recognize and generate value on the network. Now, I think there's a lot to elaborate here because uh, it can, it can, we can go into all sorts of things that Web3.0 enables like identity, self-sovereign identity, data, tokenizing rights, votes, appearances. You can program all these interactions. Uh, but I think let's move on to the, the other questions. The last thing I'll add here is, is that Web3.0 is now only possible because we are able to have a technology with blockchain to enable a decentralized interaction as opposed to centralized entities like, uh, like tra let's say traditional software developers or game developers who are able to control the universe, uh, who then present these risks uh, for these assets. With this more decentralized or like shared layer, we're able to create Web 3.0. And like you said, there are so many different areas we could explore about this. But today, yep. I mean, for, for business leaders listening, if we look at that financial space, could you tell me a little bit more about how we ultimately re reinventing the legacy of the Internet, but for purpose and profit? Because that's where the real exciting stuff is, isn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So instead of going to the more kind of fluffy components, yeah. we want to anchor ourselves in in what the real value of Web3 is for business leaders today. So when we talk about reinventing uh, the internet for, for like purpose, profit, and payments or finance in general, we can, we can go back to an idea about the original sin of the internet. Actually, uh, Mark Andreessen, I think, was the one who popularized this idea that the, the internet was born with a, a fundamental problem and that we are not able to pay for things really easily. And there's a lot of friction, especially at the, at the beginning. Nowadays, it's much easier. But in the beginning, there was simply no easy way that like credit cards were not digitized. Uh, they tried to do it with Netscape, uh, but the credit card companies didn't even want to integrate. They didn't understand that it was too difficult. So what uh, the Web 2.0 companies ended up doing, a lot of them, is pivot to an, an advertising model. And so that's what Google and Facebook are doing today. And because of this model, the free content and engagement has to translate into uh, more like data for advertising and for more like behavioral modification. So this is where, uh, for example, one of the authors right now, uh, Sashana Zuboff, wrote about surveillance capitalism. And this creates an incentive 
for companies which operate on free models uh, and, and monetizing advertising, they have to subject themselves to modifying user behavior and collecting user data uh, so that they can survive. It's not that they're, they're evil, but this kind of model pushes them towards like exploiting users' attention, making them more addicted, and fundamentally influencing their behavior in ways that they may not realize or may not want. So what Web 3.0 brings us is an alternative where the users can more easily pay for things. And I think we are already starting to see the trend moving towards that, right? Uh, more and more businesses are moving to a subscription business model. I'm paying for my music. I'm paying for my video content on, on Netflix, for example. I'm paying for my uh, video conferencing software. I'm paying for news and journalism, even with, say, uh, MIT Technology Review or Wired Magazine. So these models, when you have subscription, it no longer depends on a kind of winner-takes-all data economy, which uh, Google and, and Facebook have dominated. Now, if you can generate value that the user recognizes, they can pay you directly and you can survive. And importantly, users are learning that they can and should pay for things that they want. So we are already moving towards this direction. And Web 3.0 brings us to the next level. Not only can we very easily pay with, for example, our credit card, but imagine things which are automated in payments triggered by certain actions. Imagine I can put in uh, like a, a $10 browsing budget. And every time I visit any website, uh, interact with, with any platform, I can stream micro payments by the second. Maybe each second I spend on a journalistic website, I can pay them in, a, in micro cents or a, a few cents per, per minute. And these, all of these interactions can be automated and completely transparent and uh, triggered uh, by these like, public interactions, which are internet native. So today, what we need to do is that we need to integrate a third party software who can help you manage these interactions and uh, they are subject to uh, license regulations. Uh, some of them may be inefficient as well. You have to handle so many different currencies, there are inefficiencies and hidden fees uh, often. What uh, Web 3.0 can offer you when you can have digital native assets is that this is much more frictionless. And this means we are making, when you, when you make something really easy, you also make something really abundant. And hence, we can expect to see more internet companies start to bloom. So here's where we get to some of the second order effects. When we talk about frictionless payments and economic uh, movements or uh, movement of assets, this means that anyone who can create value can generate value really easily. Right? And this, is, this will coincide with the emergence of, say, 5G, VR, AR, IoT, where assets or data can flow in much larger volumes, you can create more virtual goods with VR and AR, and you can have more machine-to-machine -machine interactions or rights with IoT. One of the easiest examples to understand is, if you want to mine Bitcoin, all you need to do is have some computing power uh, if you if previously you can even use your laptops or your desktops and offer up that computing power to mine certain Bitcoin. And because your computing power or nowadays your storage space, your time and attention, all these things are valuable assets. You can put these to work uh, in systems that require those resources. So with Bitcoin as an example, I can offer up my computing power and I can get paid for it on the Internet just purely automatically. No one can stop me from doing this. Anybody can and can do this. Uh, and you don't need a platform to govern this thing, manage all the revenues. All of it is governed by code. That's what we mean by uh, this automated interactions for Web 3.0. Now, what does this mean? We can take a little step further. Now, here, here is where things may get a little bit bizarre. But if we look at the third order effects, when anyone, anywhere, can provide 
activities uh, or resources that can generate value and then get rewarded for that in a digital native way, we actually create a much fairer and open market. Because instead of, let's say, a one company uh, offering up all the computing resources, everybody can do it. Instead of one company offering uh, software, writing software, instead of one company uh, offering up all the attention that users can provide, anybody that is able to accumulate and gather these resources and bring it to the market can get rewarded. So I like to compare it a bit to, uh, to for example, like restaurants. Why do we think uh, restaurants are, even though we have, say, McDonald's and Starbucks, these giant chains which are dominating the market, but local mom and pop stores can still survive. And there's a high turnover, new restaurants are being born all the time, the ones which are less popular die off. And that's because there's a fair playing field when the users are abundant and where you have equal access to each of these services. Instead of uh, having a, a monolithic kind of a, a data dominance, you can have anybody contributing to it. And they can contribute to it without a central party in the middle governing all of these interactions. It just needs to be code because it's all digital. And this creates possibilities for like decentralized autonomous organizations where you can uh, automate even, for example, all the interactions required in a company to run a business. So Bitcoin is a very simple example for mining Bitcoin, but you can program other interactions as well, such as a simple storefront or, uh, for example, a an outsourcing agency. And this can be applied not only to private institutions, but also nonprofits. Uh, with new forms of value generated, for example, tokenizing your reputation or goodwill. So I know it's, it's getting quite bizarre here. So I just want to wrap up this question with uh, a statement that what we are seeing is potentially a future in Web 3.0, where the winners are no longer those who most effectively kill off competition and trap users, but those who truly and consistently serve users' needs. So that means for companies, instead of trying to uh, kill off competitors and like build these uh, insurmountable moats, there's a need to focus more now on what generates value for the market, for consumers. And when we're talking about this technology, another topic that will always appear is the challenge of adoption and getting more and more people on board. But as Web 3.0 enters the building, can you tell me more about how actually blockchain is already building a community for it, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So the ideas that I talked about may sound quite bizarre to the, the common person uh, who's not familiar with the blockchain community. But actually within the ecosystem, because it, it is really kind of like a parallel world where you have your own infrastructure, your own ecosystem and economic uh, assets and in incentives. The blockchain community in parallel has been building such a community because the, the, the layer one blockchains like Ethereum or Bitcoin provide a public infrastructure for developers to build any kind of inter interactions or applications that they want. So a couple of examples. Firstly, in the finance sector, there are a few projects, for example, MakerDAO create a stable coin, which is a, a digital asset that's pegged to USD. And it's completely self-collateralized, run by code. I send in my Ethereum tokens. I can generate these stable coins with stable value. I can then use these stable coins and park it with a second project called Compound, uh, where I can earn interest based on these assets because the, the code will automatically lend out these assets to margin traders who may want uh, to use these tokens in the short term. I could also bring it to another platform called Synthetix. And with that, they track real world prices of, say, gold, silver, a basket of currencies and other cryptocurrencies. And so I can convert it into synthetic versions of these assets and be exposed uh, to the price tracking of these various assets. And the beauty of all of this is that they don't need to create uh, APIs to interact with each other. They don't need to forge partnerships because they're all written in the same infrastructure. All of them are just interacted by code. So 
by default, they are already integrated with each other and any user can take any of these assets and move it around all of these different protocols and even create an interface where you can uh, manage all of these assets across all of these projects from one place. So we are actually working with some of these players, uh, which I mentioned, like MakerDAO, Synthetix, uh, and, a, and a UX platform called Instadap uh, for one of these initiatives, uh, which we will announce shortly. <laughs> Keep your eyes out for that. Another quick example I can share is in non-fungible tokens, because this is a more famous example on uh, CryptoKitties, <laughs> which people have heard about, just collectible online kittens which can be worth thousands of dollars. Anybody can buy and sell, anybody can breed them, and then you can trade them on, on a market open sea. And these things have real uh, tangible value that has been demonstrated in the market, including the finance examples I mentioned just now. In February this year, more than 1 billion in assets have been locked. Uh, and even though the cryptocurrency is going through some volatility right now, the amount of assets locked in there is still worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And a lot of people listening, especially business leaders, might be concerned about the increasing power that tech companies are getting now, especially because they're moving so much quicker than regulations out there. So if I look back, tech companies such as Google started out with the motto, don't be evil. But I'm curious, how can that be changed to can't be evil moving forward, do you think? Yes, yes, exactly. So you're exactly right. One of the great risks of moving to Web 3.0, when you involve these uh, digital assets, is that these companies will amass even more power if they can control the movement of goods and currency. And that's why, for example, the US is really afraid of Facebook creating their own Libra. They see it as like a private currency, which may threaten the sovereignty of the US dollar. But the alternative, is, create, is building something like this on a public uh, or transparent distributed ledger or a blockchain. And when you do that, the interactions are not only programmable, they are open, transparent, and auditable. So anyone can go ahead and read the code. And if the person is technically uh, sound, they, they would be able to interpret such that, oh, okay, this smart contract or this interaction will uh, make your asset transform into this, or it will allow you to do these particular features uh, with your assets. And that's it. It doesn't do anything else behind it. So you can actually guarantee certain outcomes instead of trusting the black box of organizations, which, for example, you may use a certain platform to post your social media content, uh, or you may use it to search for certain things, connect with certain friends, uh, you may be sharing your location data, but you don't know what they're doing with it. You don't know uh, what else are they doing to track your metadata, how else are they trying to influence your behavior when, uh, based on when you may be most susceptible to it. Uh, it's a complete black box, uh, whereas these open interactions are completely uh, governable and auditable. A simple analogy to understand this is kind of like a self-service vending machine, which is transparent and you can see the insides. You know that when you put in the money, the can of uh, Coke is going to come out and you can see all the machinations inside and maybe some parts are hidden, but interaction is very direct and straightforward. And so what, what we think Web 3.0 offers, which is different uh, from this kind of Web 2.0 black box, is that not only are the interactions uh, open and transparent. It gives you involvement in the kind of uh, social, uh, economic, and political spectrum of uh, products and services. The reason that the organizations today can must say uh, don't be evil or must transition to can't be evil is that they, they have to manage all these users uh, and the users can self-govern in a social way, they can interact, but the economic incentives and the political power to determine how the, what the platform does completely lies with the company, the private organization. With Web 3.0, imagine something like Bitcoin, where the interactions are completely public or governed by code. You actually return these like economic and political power or incentives back to the user so that everybody can involve, be involved. And this is an alternative 
which is community-based and community-driven. Now, I understand that it, it may sound quite bizarre, uh, and people may still prefer the convenience of uh, normal organizations, private organizations. But what we predict is that as people uh, face, let's say, certain exploitations or abuse of power, which may or may not be inevitable as these companies grow bigger, decentralized Web3 organizations offer an alternative which may be like green companies or ethical companies where if the users eventually prefer these options, these larger corporations may feel that they are compelled to adopt these more transparent and decentralized alternatives. And Longhash Ventures is a global blockchain incubator and investor. And my understanding is that you guys seek financial returns through venture building and investing in early stage blockchain startups. So can you tell me more about your mission to enable a Web 3.0 blockchain native economy? Because it sounds incredibly exciting. So like I mentioned just now, uh, the Web 3.0 is created not in isolation because you need all of the infrastructure to enable it. So to realize Web 3.0, we are investing and incubating in the full stack, including infrastructure, so things like hardware and connectivity, to the protocol layer, uh, imagine like uh, competitors or alternatives to Bitcoin and Ethereum, to the middleware, things like uh, identity or data sharing, and up to the applications as well. We're also uh, investing and incubating transition projects, which bring users and data uh, and compliance to Web 3.0. So things like education, debt crypto gateways, uh, KYC AML for uh, compliance. So we work with all of these companies with a focus on projects which are immediately needed and immediately usable. So for example, uh, we are working with a high speed blockchain called Plasm, incredible top researchers from Japan, where you have the youngest blockchain researcher from University of Tokyo. We're working with, for example, 8Tech, who are providing self-sovereign identity to uh, people who receive aid and remittances so that you can more transparently track some of these donations that are being happening. So much of it is being lost today. We're working with applications like Brighttree, who make the marine uh, refueling or patrol supply chain much more uh, traceable and trackable because they have the IoT to go with that. And for example, fiat crypto gateways, easy ways for people to, to buy crypto if they wish. For example, Zanpool uh, in Singapore and Asia. At the same time, we keep an eye out for longer term uh, blockchain native bets. So for example, exciting projects which can connect different blockchains together like Polkadot or people who are building tokenization standards and interfaces like Alpha Wallet or help you manage your private keys in Web 3.0 uh, with biometrics like a project like Keyless. So because we are investing and incubating across this full stack, we expect our portfolio to be far more synergistic than any traditional VC in the long run as we build out this ecosystem. And we'll have a lot of uh, startup founders listening. So uh, the question that they're going to be wanting me to ask you is, what are you looking for in a blockchain startup? And how can the founders make themselves more attractive to somebody like yourself at Long Hash Ventures? Great question. Yes, actually, we get asked this all the time. And like any traditional VC or incubator, the normal conditions still apply. So having the right domain expertise, the right technical expertise, the right vision with the team, looking at a problem that is big enough, scalable, with the right timing, uh, and of course, having you know a good traction, for example, revenue, users, growth, and strong differentiation from your competition or how you plan to adopt a win in this market are all important. But what's special to us is the additional question of like why why blockchain? And are you Web 3.0 native? Are you a digital native company? Only then can a startup truly fit into our ecosystem and portfolio and be aligned with the long-term vision and thesis that we have that Web 3.0 will definitely dominate the next generation of the internet. And I think lastly, that we also look at whether these startups have a good fit with us 
because we do uh, prefer to work with earlier stage startups and people who, for example, need more help uh, with our network in Asia. So Lomesh Ventures, we are, the main base of operations is in Singapore, but we also have people and partners across Hong Kong, China, Japan, Korea, uh, Berlin, where there's a strong developer community as well. So we want to support and help get ready these innovative ideas even before they're presented to the world, super early stage. We've had projects come to us even at the idea stage. And, and what's different about an incubator, like I mentioned of these locations, is engagement that we're super hands-on and spending our own time bringing in mentors who are uh, in the blockchain sector, who are academics in say cryptography and game theory, investors in traditional and blockchain space, corporates in, in like financial sector, supply chain, energy, government related entities, which are supporting us as well. Uh, and of course, our Asian network, any partners or communities they like to get in touch with. Fantastic. And looking towards the future, what's next for Long Cash Ventures? I appreciate you probably can't share too much because the Reddit communities will jump on your every word. But is there anything <laughs> you can share or leave us with a teaser maybe? All right. I can share one thing, which is uh, we have been investing in a more ad hoc manner. Uh, but late last year, we actually got our VC license or a fund manager license in Singapore. So we'll be formalizing our investment process and structure while continuing our incubation efforts. So you can expect to see us uh, scaling up and formalizing our investment activities pretty soon. And for anyone that would like to find out more information about Long Hash Ventures and any of the topics we've discussed today, or even a startup founder that wants to reach out and have a conversation with you, what's the best way of doing that? The easiest way is to go to our website, longhashventures.com. So it's long as in short and long, hash as in like hash brown or the cryptography hash, if you're familiar, <laughs> ventures.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn as Long Hash or Twitter as Long Hash Hatch, which is the incubation program. And I will add that, in fact, applications are open right now for our incubation investment for an upcoming batch, as well as a virtual hackathon that we are organizing. So you can find all this on our website. And I'd like to share that we know it's a difficult time for everybody right now, especially startups, uh, which usually have quite a short runway, uh, who may not have revenue yet. So we want to support founders in this difficult time. And that's why we have organized this virtual hackathon, especially to address immediate needs to help with the COVID-19 situation. So we hope this the cash prices from the hackathons can help uh, both the startup founders as well as the communities that we are in. We are also helping founders uh, get grants from the Singapore government which they have generously set aside a, a significant amount for, and also helping startups with investments or fundraising as well. We think uh, these initiatives, especially uh, like the hackathon, which helps with the COVID-19 situation, are especially powerful when you can bring together the people who truly need solutions and the people who are capable of building them. And that's what really inspires us to continue working in this industry, is building technology which will have impact for wider society. What a great move. I love that. I think it's so important because I think the global community is suffering together at the moment and initiatives like that are so valuable to ensure that we can all come through it together. And also Web 3.0 is incredibly exciting and the opportunities ahead. So it's important to recognize that. And I think you coming on here today and demystifying that technology by unpacking it in a language that everyone can understand is so valuable too. So thank you so much for taking taking the time to come and speak with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I love spending a bit of time with today's guest there and unpacking Web3.0, reinventing the legacy of the internet, but for purpose and profit and exploring that dichotomy between don't be evil and can't be evil. I think that's so important. And finally, of course, as Web3.0 enters the building phase, Blockchain is already building a community for it. And I think that point is lost so many times. But enough from me waffling on. What did you take away from today's conversation? Whatever it is, I implore you all to send me a quick hello, ask a question, come on the podcast, 
whatever it is. And let's get through this sticky period together. So you can find me by emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. You'll find links to all my social channels and nearly 1,200 podcast interviews on there. But that's it for me today. So a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.